Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love and your grace for us. Father, we ask forgiveness of our sins, and we ask that tonight your name would be glorified and honored, that we would set it apart, that in everything we do and say that you would be, you'd receive the glory and the honor, Father. We also ask for just all the troubles around the world, and we see injustice, we see pandemic and crises, we see abuse, we see prejudice, as we talked about tonight. Father God, I pray that we would look to our own heart, that we would, your Holy Spirit would reveal to us first uh, our own weaknesses, our own sin, our own failures. And Father God, I pray that you would transform our hearts, give us eyes to see, ears to hear. And I also do pray for those injustices and those prejudices, those uh, the struggles that we see around. Father, I pray that light would expose truth and that justice would triumph. And that most importantly, Father God, that your name and the name of your son would be exalted. So we commit this time to you tonight. Bless it, bless each one here. May you encourage our spirit. Help us to do your will. It's in Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things by faith. Amen. Okay, good. So tonight we are doing... <laughs> Don't be stressed, okay? I just, don't be stressed. But um, so uh, we're doing, we're going to be doing narrative structure analysis. <laughs> so, so narrative structure analysis, don't be stressed uh, because in some passages you will do the intra and the inter. Uh, that's for like epistles, that's for discourse, like when Jesus is teaching. In other passages of scripture, in stories, in parables, in other, uh, like Old Testament, in the Acts of the Apostles, you will not really do that. You will not use the inter-sentence or the, or the intra-sentence analysis. That's not as helpful. What you will rather do is the narrative structure, because narrative structure has different it's structured differently. It's structured like a story. And so this is, if you can imagine, you have the intra and the inter sentence analysis. And now there's a new parallel tool for a different genre. That's the narrative structure analysis. Okay. So when you're working through the process, if you were teaching, let's say in the book of Jonah, if you were teaching in Genesis, if you were teaching in, uh, gospels you would not focus as much on the inter and the intra although you could use those as well but this is a different type of examination that really focuses upon the story if you're to teach a story okay so i hope it's helpful i hope it doesn't stress you out this is not a vote this is not adding to the process it meaning to say that now we have three different things you're going to do at the same no 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 it's going to be an either or, an either or, okay? Uh, if we don't finish tonight, we'll continue this next week. And then after narrative, we'll have uh, poetic genre. So again, I'll give you another, another out handout for, for, the, for, a, for the, the, the poetry genre, which is different than narrative, which is different than epistolary. So I hope you're seeing how we're looking at different structures if I'm going to use an engineering or architectural analogy, it's like, com it's like comparing the structure of, of, a, of a skyscraper to the structure of maybe a, a house to maybe the structure of a, of a boat, <laughs> something like that. A boat, a car, a house, a skyscraper. A lot of, there's parallel engineering and architectural uh, rules and methods, but there's also different engineering, there's different schematics, and so that's what we're doing here. So imagine this is being an or, this is not and, it's an or. So this is another method if you are not in epistolary, if you are not uh, in a discourse like the Sermon on the Mount, but you're actually in a, in a narrative genre, okay? So just by, by, by way of quick overview, we'll do a PowerPoint overview, and this really follows the, app, the, the handout that I sent to you. So if you printed out the handout, this PowerPoint really follows that. So 
the content in the PowerPoint is in your handout, all right? Uh, and then we will start to look, we will apply this to Ruth chapter one. So we will do the handout and then I will start applying the method to Ruth chapter one. And then, so, and then the rest of tonight and uh, perhaps we'll continue into next week or perhaps Sunday night if everyone can attend Sunday night we will have a workshop. So you'll be able to work through the rest of Ruth. And I really hope that in looking at Ruth, you'll, you'll have, you have your own preconceptions of who the hero is, who the, uh, what the plot is, but perhaps maybe it changes a little bit. Perhaps maybe there's a, a better understanding when we're looking at this uh, narrative, this uh, narrative uh, structure. Okay. And, then we'll, and then we'll have some conclusions. So that's really the, 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 the purpose of the, the, the steps tonight. We might not finish, but we'll just continue. And the homework. There is, there is no homework for this genre. Uh, um, whatever we do in the workshop, we'll just continue to work in class because I want you to focus all your outside energy on the homework that I've already assigned. So there's no, there will be no homework for this genre. Okay, so this is just another uh, analysis that you can use, and I hope that you would use it in your Bible study, in teaching Sunday school, or small group, or perhaps preaching, okay? So um, we won't really be applying this. I just, uh, perhaps advanced hermeneutics or another class we can, or a book study, but I, I really want us to be, to be focused in on getting your other homework uh, turned in. Okay, structure analysis. So we have here, uh, we've done the intra-sentence analysis already. We've done the inter-sentence analysis. And so that's really for all epistles, all the epistles, uh, um, this, this intra-sentence and inter-sentence analysis is really designed for epistles and epistolary genre. So all of the epistles. So that would be uh, all of, all of, Paul's epistles, or did they say Pauline, Pauline epistles, the general epistles, uh, that's really focused for that. You can apply this in, so if you want to also add a caveat or, or, or a exemption, you can use this in, in uh, the discourses of Jesus. So you could apply an inter-sentence analysis to, for example, the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, you could apply that in, 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 a, in a sermon in uh, the Acts of the Apostles, you could also apply this, this uh, uh, analysis, okay? But when you're looking at narrative, historical narrative, uh, parables, this doesn't really fit, okay? Um, there is parallel, though. So I have used these even in, even in, there is overlap even in poetry. So some of these categories that I gave in the, the, the handouts, you, you'll see them in these other genres, but when you apply the analysis, it, it's not as helpful because it's a different structure and perhaps you'll get confused or perhaps your outline won't really fit. So I just want to add that caveat. So really the design of intra-sentence and inter-sentence is for epistolary genre, although you can use these elsewhere provided you have caveats, provided you're you're cautious, okay? So I, I hope that's helpful. Um, and now what we have is a, a third, so now we have a third type of analysis. This is different, okay? So narrative genre analysis, you would not apply to epistles. So if you're, if you're in a historical books, in the old, a historical book in the Old Testament, if you're in uh, Genesis, the Pentateuch, if you're in uh, some of the writings in the Old Testament, if you're in the Gospels, if you're in the Acts of the Apostles, I would not be, I would, I would use the narrative genre. I would not use the other, uh, the other analysis, okay? Um, in the future, we're going, to, we're going to be looking at poetic genre analysis. So what we'll have is we'll have essentially, there's three types of genres big genres in scripture. You have epistles, you have narrative, and then you have uh, poetry, okay? And then the other categories like law, parable, or gospel, um, uh, or prophetic, it's a combination of several. 
<laughs> so, so uh, if we can, we'll get to them. If not, that we can do a hermeneutics two or advanced hermeneutics. We can go into prophetic. I will. I will give you a handout, like a crash course handout for gospels, for prophetic, for law. Um, if we don't have the time to go there, okay. So I would give you a handout, a crash course handout that you could use if you're pastor or you're preaching and you're going to work through Isaiah, uh, it would be helpful to have to highlight those things. But the actual specific genre within, like, for example, Isaiah, it's going to, to have narrative and it's going to have poetic and it's combining the two. So there are some key, some key categories for prophetic genre. Again, that would be the structure, but it's, it's not solely poetic. It's not solely narrative. You actually see a combination of the two. Same thing for wisdom. Um, and so <laughs> Kaya no doubt has experienced that <laughs> in Ecclesiastes. I was tempted, Kaya, because of your choice. I was tempted, but, but your specific passage, you can use the epistolary application. That's why I'm saying it's not black and white. So you can apply the epistolary genre analysis because it's your your text is very focused so it's fine but looking at bigger sections you have to be cautious same thing with shoni shoni's doing a prayer in daniel and so her specific prayer she can apply the epistolary genre because it's very specific and it's just speaking you're not combining narrative and all these other things it's it's a very specific passage but when you're looking at the bigger picture no doubt shoni was thinking like, oh, there's also narrative, and there's also, in, in, uh, in the book of Daniel, there's, there's, it's prophetic, so there's, there's, there's prophecies, there's visions, there's prayers, there's narrative, there's poetry, <laughs> hollow, hollow. <laughs> so, so that's why we have, we'll have some of those other things to consider when you're dealing with prophetic genre, when you're dealing with, um, these other more uh, gospels, more complex, okay? So, um, yeah, but don't be afraid. Don't feel as if, don't feel as if, wow, I can never do this, Tim. It's just like a tool. When you get the, the, the tools and you have the ratchet, the sockets, you get the vice grips, you're like, oh, there's so many, and you get stressed, but you, know, you have a hammer, you have, you have a saw, you have a tape, there's so many different tools, right? But as you slowly just learn, you realize that each tool in the toolbox is for a different problem to solve. And so in the same way, I hope that slowly you will see that these are different tools that you can use uh, to solve uh, the various interpretation. And even though this is stressful, you're, we're going up the mountain and you're at a better position than you were <laughs> three months ago, right? You know, one time I was climbing up a mountain, uh, my own, my own. One time my, my family drove the side, we hiked a little bit. Of the side. This is many years ago when I was a child. And right, you look up and it's so big, right? You're like, how can I do it? But then you turn around and you look at the view and the view is so nice, right? And so this is where we're at. We look back and we have such a beautiful view, but we look up and it's like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I won't belabor the point. Okay, so. Uh, let's get into narrative structure analysis. It's actually not that difficult. It, it, it's actually not that difficult. And so don't be stressed if you have your handout, whether printed out or uh, in the PDF. Uh, just a basic definition. So I have several key ideas as a definition for narrative. So um, uh, biblical narratives, just as an as a introductory statement, biblical narratives contain both history and theology history and theology but it's different than epistolary because of many times in epistles it's just giving direct commands it's very it's in many ways very easy um, uh, but it's not the same thing uh, narrative is a literary form that is characterized by sequential time action that involves plot setting characters it is the story form of literature. So think of narrative as story. 
it's it's we're looking at a story okay i don't i don't use story i i, I want to use narrative or story because sometimes when you use the word story people get the idea that it's not real okay we're dealing with historical narrative we're dealing with real people we're dealing with real history and so many people Philippines is moving in this direction. America's already there, but many people will say these are great stories. Just learn the lesson from the story, but it wasn't real. And so we don't want to say that. So there's, there, is some, there is some thinking behind using this idea of narrative. Um, and, and if you want to say historical narrative, that's fine as well. Um, there are a few stories that aren't real. So for example, a parable would be a story, but it's not real. Okay, so there is, there is that, that caveat there, okay. Um, rather than telling us how to live or how not to live, the narrative shows us how to live or how not to live by the actions of the characters. So this is a little more tricky, right? It's not telling us what to do, it's showing us what to do, okay? Now, this was, the, this was a definition, this was a, an explanation by Duval and Hayes, one of the readings for, um, from CGST BTC. I did feel that it's a little incomplete because of our discussion on, especially if you're doing the big story of the Bible, that there's the, the discussion of how the smaller stories, the smaller narratives, are pointing towards the bigger narrative. So I, I have a, a, a clarification here that we need to really need to consider. It's that it's more than just how to live or how not to live. To only look at the stories as how to live or how not to live is to really miss what we've been, what we've been talking about, considering Christ and the gospel, considering the plan of God, seeing how a, how a narrative, how a story fits in the grand uh, story that God is that God has declared that God is bringing into reality and so more than this it shows us what God is doing and what God will do to reveal himself and his will to mankind and to restore humanity into a right relationship with himself so that is a, a third a, a fourth characteristic a second component it's more than, the stories do teach us how to live. So we, we can see in Noah's story that he was righteous, that he lived by faith, that he was faithful to what God called him to do. Absolutely. Amen. Altar call, right? But, but to only see it at that level, you miss what God is doing. You miss what God is doing in the big story. How Noah and the salvation and judgment in Noah's day is pointing towards a greater salvation, is pointing towards a greater judgment that is to come. And so here we're including this, that the story also points not only to telling us how to live, how not to live, but more importantly, we could say more fundamentally, it's showing us what God is doing, how God works in the world, what God does in the world, and what God will do. And so the stories, especially in the Old Testament, are prophetic. They are prophetic. I, I would recommend that you write it down. The stories in the Old Testament are prophetic. Um, and I think you're going to see that in Ruth, in Ruth tonight. You're going to say, Tim, I don't know. You're going to see that. Ruth's story is both uh, moral in nature, telling us how we ought to live, but prophetic. You're going to see prophetic statements okay uh, i hope you're going to see that all right and so very important for us to consider and so when you're teaching when you're preaching when you're looking at these narratives we cannot and, and we we have this in the process so this is i'm sharing this within the broader context of our interpretative method We're, we've already considered uh in those steps we we both before and then after the analysis, you will be considering Christ and the gospel, God's plan. But I really want to emphasize, as you analyze the stories, be, the, the, the easiest temptation is just to, 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 how does this apply to me? 
without even considering how it is connected to God's plan. And um, maybe not tonight, but, but, but I will show you some very interesting things, even in the story of David and Goliath, that really suggests that David and Goliath is pointing not just to how we have all to have faith, but how David is, is a type of Jesus and, and Goliath is a type of Satan. <laughs> And it's, in the, and it's in the Hebrew. It's not in, it's not in the English. We kind of miss it, but it's in the Hebrew. Um, uh, uh, anyway, and I'll save that for another time. Okay, um, moving on here. Questions to consider. So these questions, uh, we, we, we have this in the, in the process. Um, but, and so I'm not saying, okay, do this again. But what I am saying is that if you're, if you're doing a narrative analysis, you really need to be uh, refocusing on. You need to be refocusing on these questions here. So this is a re repetitive. You've already had these questions in the que asking great questions, making making uh, asking important questions, making great observations. But but in the narrative analysis, you really want to have these questions uh, that you're considering. And so these questions, of, of course, are who, what, when, where. Why, how, and for what purpose? So um, we, we've already had these. So we're asking these questions. So I apologize for that delay. We're asking these questions, okay? So next, literary features that we're going to be considering. Number one, the, the implied author and narrator, okay? We, many times when we're reading a story, we don't even think about this. There is an implied author or narrator that's typically the editor. You have someone that's telling the story, the author, and he's actually giving you information and he's, he's assumed this uh, omniscient perspective. In, in some ways, he's assumed the perspective of God who, who sees all things, who can look behind the curtain and explain what's going on in the background, okay? And so when you see these, when you see the narrator step in, that's not a small, that's not a small um, uh, item. That's very big. You need, to, you need to immediately highlight why is the narrator, the narrator is highlighting something for me to really consider. So the biblical narrator is indistinguishable from God who inspires him at this point, okay? The choice to devise an omniscient narrator serves the purpose of it staging and glorifying an omniscient God. The narrator has a bird's eye view of the events and a full understanding of what is occurring. Okay, so when the narrator says something, for example, I'll just give a quick example. In the, in the, in the, infancy, uh, in the infancy narratives of, of, of Jesus and the, 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 the angel goes to Joseph in Matthew 1, 18, I think 21 or 24, uh, Matthew 1, 18 to 24, and he's telling Joseph what's going to happen. Okay, so he's like, you're going to call his name Jesus, for he will save his people um, uh, from their sins. And then um, the narrator explains that, that this was to fulfill Emmanuel, and he quotes the, 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 the prophecy of Emmanuel, and then he says, this means, which means God with us, okay? So there's two things. Jesus will save his people from their sins, and it's God with us. So that's not something small. And what you're going to see throughout Matthew's gospel is that Jesus is God with us. <laughs> and, that, and, and quite not ironically, God's, remember the lordship, authority, power and presence. And Jesus exemplifies all three of those. <laughs> Jesus is, uh, has authority. Jesus is all powerful. He commands the wind and the waves, right? So, and then Jesus is with us, all right? So what I'm trying to get at is just that when the, when the author, when the narrator, whoever's writing it, when the narrator stops and says, this means that, or this was to, to fulfill that. It's not something small. It's major. The narrator is like stopping the story. It's like, reader, listen, this is what it means. Like, so he's, it's, it's not a small thing. It's a very big thing. And so you always have to be thinking about when you read a story, 
<laughs> when, the, when the author starts giving information, he stops the story and it gives an explanation. That's big, that's not small. Uh, plot. So the predominant, uh, the predominant uh, uh, focus will be is uh, looking at the plot. This is how the whole story is structured together. A plot is the organizing structure that ties the story or narrative together. So several key components of a plot that you need to consider. Number one, setting. This is an introductory statement that provides the reader with, or listener with context for the story, it includes location, time, and other critical information. So setting is so critical. It's actually incredibly important. Um, initial conflict. What is the first incident that creates the problem that needs to be reconciled? So initial conflict. Rising action. These are actions, physical or mental, that increases the tension in a story or plot. So rising action isn't necessarily a bad thing. Rising action um, isn't always, it could actually be a good thing as well. You don't want to ask the question, is it a good action or a bad action? Although that, that will help get at the, uh, the, the definition or get at the type. What you want to ask is, does the action increase the tension or decrease? So it's not so much about a good or bad action, although a bad action does raise, it does increase the, 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 the situation. What you want to be asking is the tension. Does the action raise the tension or lower the tension? Is the action bringing the story to, to a resolution or is it heightening the tension in the mind of the, or in the, in the, mind of, of, of the viewer? Or, or, or the list, okay? Climax. The climax is the moment in the story at which the tension connected with the problem is at a maximum. The climax is the moment when the, there is, you don't know what's gonna happen. Is, is it gonna be okay, right? And so you're on the edge of the seat, all right? That's the climax. And then as soon as that, there's an action that either, you know, turns into a tragedy, it's just sad and the, the, the hero dies, or the hero shoots the bad guy, uh, you know, and, the, and he falls down, right? And, and there's still, there's still this, there's still a, a falling action to follow, but the climax is the moment at which the action is rising, there's huge tension, 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 and then something happens and immediately there's a release. Ah, it's going to be okay. Ah, he's going to get the girl. Ah, they're going to be married. And then, and then there's this, this falling action until there is a resolution. Okay, so there is this resolution. So you have the setting that sets up the whole story. That's, that's the, maybe you could say introduction. You have initial conflict, rising, act, rising action, climax, falling action resolution, okay? So, moving along here. Um, the next thing we see here before we get to uh, the, the method, now, I am, not being, um, I am not being incredibly precise. I'm not dealing with, they have like technical words, antagonist, protagonist, all this other stuff. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to force you to know that. What I just, I'm going to keep it basic, okay? Characters are the ones that do the action and advance the story, okay? And there's different types of characters. There's the hero. The hero is the character that changes or grows throughout the story. So a hero is the one who, um, um, who changes through the story, okay? So sometimes we confuse a supporting character with the main character, okay? Sometimes we confuse the supporting character with the main character. Typically, the hero, or I think sometimes they call it the pro, the protagonist. That's the one who is he, he, his character changes from the beginning to the end. Okay. Then you have the the villain um, is the one who is against the hero. Stories don't always have villains. Okay, but you could have a villain in the story. And then you have static characters. Static characters are part of the story, but are present in order for the plot to be advanced, but they don't change. They're, they're part of the plot, they're part of, 
of, of the situation moving the climax, but they themselves are not the hero. So um, even thinking about Ruth, is Ruth the hero or is she a static character and is someone else the, the hero? Something to think about, something to think about, okay? Um, okay, so character. So you're looking at the plot, you have to look in an analysis, a narrative analysis, you have to look at the plot, all the different parts of the plot. You have to look at the characters, how the characters grow. Um, and so what we have here is you can, people can debate and go back and forth. What I have here, and, I'll, and I'll, when you do the workshop, I'll send out an actual, um, an actual uh, worksheet that you can, I think I posted it, but for those who don't have Facebook, I'll, I'll send out, um, I'll send out the, uh, the doc file email. But so, so what we, this is a tangible way by which you can analyze and find the setting, find the rising action, find the climax, find the falling, uh, the falling action, and fall, find the, 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 the resolution, okay? Um, Henry has seen this one time with the, with the parable of the prodigal son. Okay, so Henry has seen this one time in action. And uh, it's not what you think at first, right, Henry? It's very, uh, this is going to be a, 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 a precise way of working through a story. And so you're going to have, you're, you're going to deal with a, oh, surprise, not yet. You're going to deal with, a, you're going to deal with the location. So you'll put the verse, you'll put the person who is doing the, the actor, the one who's doing the action, the specific action. And then you're going to, ah, you're going to make an identification. Is this action raising the tension, decreasing the tension, or maybe it doesn't do anything, it's just neutral, okay? So you're gonna be asking that question for each, for each action statement, okay? Um, and then after you make that assessment, you, you need to, to determine what, where is that on the, in the plot? Is it a setting, is it initial conflict, is it rising action, is it climax, is it falling action, is it resolution, okay? So I'm just gonna give you a hint right now. Most of your actions will be rising or falling, okay? You're gonna have one or two that's a setting. You're gonna have one or two that's an initial conflict. You're gonna have one or two, maybe five, maybe four or five that's resolution. But most of your, the, the, the types in the plot will be rising or falling action, okay? I did include this location category here because you can also trace where the story is, because sometimes location is significant. I don't think, um, and that's actually significant in Ruth's story. We might or might not focus on that tonight. That's more advanced, but um, you could also consider in a story the location. Sometimes the place is significant. And in Ruth's situation, it is. I did, I did not include it in your handout. Um, you, could, you could consider it, okay? And then, and then, I have another category for notes. So in the notes, you're going to make comments from each line that you're looking at, okay? Um, because those things will be important when, when you preach or teach, okay? So um, this is not perfect. This is not perfect. But typically what you, you end up having is something like this, okay? It's not gonna be perfect. It's not gonna be as nice as this is. But what you'll essentially have is you'll have a setting, you'll have initial conflict, you'll have a rising action, you'll have this climax, and, and you'll be able to see when you plot each, each action, you'll see it. When you plot, when you plot each one, you're, you're, it's, you're, gonna, you're, gonna see, you're gonna see this bell curve develop, okay? And if it doesn't develop, perhaps that's also telling us something, okay? Okay, so you have, you have, the, the, you have the handout. Let's take a 10 minute break. Okay, I just sent it, I just sent it to everyone, okay? So when you start the workshop, if you wanna check your email, you can. All right, so let me just show an example. Henry was asking for me to show an example and I'll show you what I'm referring to here. So, um, and then we'll actually, we'll, we'll actually do a little bit of plotting ourselves before you, I send you away. Okay, so let me just quickly bring this up. Um, just imagine here, you can create this on Excel. I, I sent you a docx file, which is easy. So you have a, in the first column, you're going to put the verse location, okay? So each verse 
Um, now, you don't have, I included the text for, for in the one class I was teaching. You don't have to, that's a lot of typing, okay? That's a lot of typing. It took me a little bit of time, okay? Um, what, what, uh, so you don't have to do that unless you want to. What I, what, what I want you to focus on is instead of having a text here, you would have the actor. You write down the actor. So each action, okay, there's going to be an actor and there's going to be an action. So that's the two, ignore that text. Ignore this text here, okay? You're going to have this, this should be actor and this should be action, okay? And then you're going to make an, uh, uh, an, an analysis. Is this, uh, the plus is referring to increasing in tension. So is this something that creates tension? Or is this a minus, meaning to say there's this falling, there is this falling action. Uh, there's, the, the tension is decreasing, okay? Then you're going to make an identification of, is it setting, is it initial conflict, is it rising action? I don't have initial conflict here, but probably this, this one should have been initial conflict. All right. And then notes here is different key ideas that, that are significant in the story that, that, you, that you see. Okay. Now, look, look at how I'm going to plot trace it. Okay. This, this might be a little... <laughs> stressful but i hope it, it makes sense so then if if you identify the action as being it, it creates tension okay you're going to use a red and you're going to give plus one okay so then the next if it also builds it's plus you're just going to add okay so it's just like a, 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 a stair climb you're just climbing a stairs okay each one adds okay and then you're going to get to a place where uh, instead of continuing to go up, there's going to be a drop. All right. So this is, this is falling action here. This is falling action. Okay. Everyone tracking with me there. So, the, so one is rising, the other's falling. Okay. So in, in this particular story, it, it didn't actually come to, uh, a good conclusion. The ending was sad because you thought that it was going to be a good ending. Anyone who knows the prodigal son, right? You think it's going to be a good ending. And then all of a sudden the older brother comes on the scene and then he's angry. And then the, the tension starts rising and rising and rising. And then the conclusion, he doesn't actually he doesn't actually accept his brother. You know, for those who know the prodigal son, right? The, the father accepts the prodigal son, but the, the, the elder brother does not. And so the story ends without a resolution. Okay? So you would not really see that. I mean, you could see it if you're really paying attention, but the analysis allows us to see how, how the plot is going. Okay? So the conclusion is really a warning against not being the older brother. <laughs> <laughs> and some other things as well, okay? So that's what we're doing here. That's what we're going to do in Ruth, okay? All right. Um, let's go ahead and let's look at Ruth. Let's look at Ruth here now. All right. So I have the text right here for Ruth, okay? To the right, I have location, actor, action, type, plot, location, notes, okay? So... Um, this is how I'm going to do it, okay? You have the text here, all right? So um, you can do this on your paper. You can do it however. What, what I'll do is I'm going to, this is where it's important to, you're separating out sentences, okay? So uh, in the days when the judges ruled, I'll separate this out, okay? So there was a famine in the land. And the man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons. So I'm just, go, I'm just breaking it out by event or action. Does everyone see that? Everyone sees what I'm doing here? So Elimelech, 
is the name of the is is the name of the is the name of the 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 man. He has a wife. He has uh, two sons. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem of Judah. They went into a country in Moab and remained there. Abimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabites' wives. The name of the one was Orpah. The name of the other was Ruth. They lived about 10 years. And both Mahlon and Kilion died so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. So everyone sees what I'm doing there, right? So I'm separating it out by action, okay? I'm not going to do all these special things like we did last time. We're just setting it up by action, okay? And so what I'm going to do over here is I'm just going to, I'm just going to, I'm just gonna write this down. You have the text before you. Um, so now I'm looking at the Bible as we fill this in, okay? So then what I see here is, I'm gonna handwrite these in, but you can type them, you can do whatever, okay? Um, so, so my first location is one, one A. There is no action or actor. Um, I should say there's no, uh, there's, uh, let, me, let me clarify back here. Um, we could say judges ruled, right? And uh, it's just in those days, right? It's in those days. So concerning the type, is this a rising action? Is this decreasing action? No, it's just making a statement. The judges ruled, right? The judges ruled. I see in those days when the judges ruled. All right. So that's it. So I'm just gonna I'm just going to put I'm just going to put a um uh I'll put a zero there, okay? Because it's not good or bad, it's just the reality. Okay, so in the plot I'm saying this is probably the setting. Okay, I'm expecting a setting, okay. And so um, there is no location and the notes, we don't really have, it's just, maybe you wanna say before, before Kings, right? It's during the judges. Is everyone tracking what I'm doing here? Make sense? I'm not, does that make sense so far? You're good? Okay, so next one, next one. Uh, there was a famine in the land. So this is one, one B. So we could say, we could just say there is no, there is no actor. There is just this, we could say famine is, right? So, so uh, let me just, let me, let me, right? There was a famine. So someone want to answer the question, is this, is this, does this create tension? Is this a good, is this a good action? Is this a good state? Does, is, is there tension there? There was a famine. Uh, what type of action is this? Anyone, it's not a trick question. What would you say? It's uh, creating tension that's positive. Yes. Yeah, so we're, maybe this is, this is contrary. We're, we're thinking about positive meaning tension is increasing. Okay. So it's not a positive action. All right. It's a negative action, but it's positive in the sense that the, 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 the graph is going to go up. Okay. So it's a mathematical. It's not, oh, it's a positive action. It's, it's positive in the sense that tension is increasing. Okay. So then if it's the first if it's the first thing that creates tension, it has to be the initial conflict, okay? Now, some people would say this is still part of the setting. Fair enough. You could also see this as part of the initial setting. Fair enough. Okay, so some people would want to say it's still, uh, um, 
yeah, you could have this, you could have this as, as part of the setting as well. Okay. So it's not black and white. All right. Because, uh, the first independent sentence is in the days when the judges ruled there was a famine in the land. Okay. So I'm just, I'm doing it this way. You could have setting. All right. Is everyone tracking with me? I'm going to identify this as initial conflict. Okay. But it's not black and white. You could say it's still setting. Okay. All right. Next we have there. And a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. Okay. So one, one C. So now that there is a, a man. Uh, Go ahead. Excuse me, Tim. Yeah. In the location for 11B, uh, farming in the land, location is Bethlehem, Judah? Yes. No, good. So, so um, we don't know how big the land is. We could say at least, we could say at least Israel, and perhaps we could say Judah. Okay. Because the famine is going to be bigger than Bethlehem, right? It's most likely either Judah or Israel. Okay. But it's a great question because we're going to have, that's going to be significant, significant for us. Okay. A man, he, he went to sojourn in Moab. Now, is this good or bad? Think, don't think, don't think, uh, don't think your context. Think Israel, Israelite context. Is going to sojourn in Moab, is that good or bad? It bad, bad, but it will create uh, more tension. <laughs> now, why do you say that, Kuyabo boy? Because remember, the Israelites are supposed to be in one place, ah. going to a place. It's not uh, an Israelite will be will cause you troubles later. Yes, because remember, he's so. Here's the notes. He's left the promised, promised land. land. So there is here, remember from our big, those who are doing big Bible's big story, right? He is leaving. He is not trusting in the promises of God. He's going somewhere else to find his food, okay? By leaving the promised land, he's saying, I no longer trust in the promises of God. Does everyone see that? Maybe you disagree, um, but I'm going to make that conclusion there. But would that make it something like, I know, Tim, not not recognizing that God is doing it also. Yes. To orchestrate some things. You're, you're not trust. Are you saying you're not recognizing that God is the provider? Is that what you're saying? You're not recognizing the fact that it could be God's purpose or will to have that kind of event happen. Yes. Otherwise, his plan would take place. Yes. So, remember, yes, no. So, you're, so what you're saying... I believe what Queer Ray is saying that the famine is part of God's plan, Biba. And so we know in Israel's history that God led them in the wilderness. And the point of leading them in the wilderness was that Israel would learn that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word. And God provided for them manna and he provided for them water. He led Abraham to the promised land. The, whatever. Whatever the future was for Israel, it was in the promised land. To leave the promised land is to leave 
the inheritance that God has given. Okay? And so this is a huge statement of a lack of faith. Okay? Um, so something to think about as you read the Old Testament, you always have to read the Old Testament in the context of Hebrews and in the context of Romans. Hebrews, Romans 4, and then also Galatians 2 to 5. Okay? So whenever we read the Old Testament, and if you say, I don't know what's in those passages, your homework tonight is to read them. Highlight them. Always go back to them. Hebrews 11, Romans 4, Galatians 2 to 5. Those are fundamental commentary on the on how we ought to read the old testament okay so let's let's go back here we have uh he had uh he and his wife and his two sons so they, so we could add here a man and family right a man and family let me just make a They all go, okay? Next, the man, the, the name of the man was Elimelech, and his wife was Naomi, and their children's names are Malon and Kilion, okay? So, what, uh, one, two. One, two. A. There's no action. The narrator just gives the names. Names are significant. So name. Name. Names of family. So those of you who are on your computers, I'm not going to do this. Let's, names are important. Narrator gives us names. What are the meaning? What are the names of what are the meanings? So you look up, you can use Step Bible, you can use your resources, Bible Hub. I'm not giving this to you. You look up and you tell me the names, the names of what these names mean. There's four here. What do they mean? I will not my God is king. Okay, so Elimelech is my king. God is king. Does he believe that? <laughs> my God is king, and you leave the, the promise. <laughs> what is the Naomi's name? Naomi means blessing. Great. What about Mal uh, what about Malon and Malon Kilion? Malon six. Six. In six. And there is six Malon. Kilion is tiny. Kilion is tiny. Dying, dying. Pining. Pining, or maybe disease. Huh? Disease, right? It means disease. Does it, uh, destruction or disease? I think it means disease. Name question. Go ahead. Pining. Why did they name their children after that kind of meaning? So I actually, my interpretation is that it actually reveals, it actually reveals the, 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 the names always have significance of the parents. So, so, so Elimelech's, Elimelech's father was probably a strong believer. Hence, he names his son, my God is king. All right. Um, 
I want to say that most likely we, we see in the naming of his children that that's, that's his view of the perception of, uh, you know, for sure, maybe there's characteristics of them being sickly or dying. Um, a liberal interpretation would say, see, this is just the narrator. It's not, they're not real people. It's just, they're just using these names to symbolize something. And, and I, I don't, we should not hold that perspective. I, I would say that the naming of the children always signified the faith or, or the type of character of the parent. It just makes sense, you know? So just like we, we name our children with significance, right? Maybe after a, after a parent, after someone else. But, but, but it, it doesn't necessarily specify the belief of the child, right? It's, it's more the parent. Does that make sense, Ray? Yeah, but at least it's like giving a curse already while they yeah. are still young. No, and I think that this is significant. This is, this is doubt. Yeah. This is doubt of the doubt. They're in a famine. Go ahead. Oh boy, go ahead. Yeah, maybe because when the two kids were born, Elimelech probably was in trouble. Maybe the, he was sickly or the child was sickly or at the time Chilion was born, maybe there was a disease. Remember also when, when, when uh, the Job and uh, Esau was born, the, the name was given to how they, were, they came out. Yeah. <laughs> that, I mean, uh, Jacob, Jacob and Esau. It was interesting how they named Jacob and Esau. Yeah. And, and, re yeah. and that's really good, Koyabo Boy. Remember, Isaac, yeah. Isaac was named Isaac, which means laughter. And, yeah. And because, yeah, because of their doubt. <laughs> because of their doubt. Their doubt. Yeah. So names are so significant in scripture, they're always significant. So we need to be paying attention to them. Great. All right. Yeah, so yeah. Um, thus does the names are there. Is the tension increasing or decreasing with the names? Anyone? Tension is increasing. Yes. Yes. Great. Okay. Right. Adding to the tension team because from the very start it's given uh, like a uh, bad omen already from yeah. the beginning. But, but for, okay, so there could be a bad omen, but at the same time, it's starting in the context of when the judges ruled and Looking at the broader context, in the days of ju the Judges, what was the life of Israel like in, in the story of Judges? For those of you who know the context of Judges, was Israel faithful in the days of the Judges? Wicked. Sometimes faithful, sometimes not. <laughs> Depending on situation. Rising and falling. This, this, is the, this, is the, this is the cycle of repentance and wickedness in Israel. Okay, so if this is, this is a, a righteous, this is wicked, and this is time, okay? This is, this is Israel right here, okay? From, from beginning to end, right? It's like this. There is a revival, there is a falling away, then they try to climb themselves back up. Maybe a better example is like this. Let me, it's like, uh, crash and burn. And, and it ends in everyone does what is right in their own eyes. So anyone who's reading, and I like what, what, what Kuya Ray was talking about, a bad omen, this is most likely because of the, the wickedness of Israel. If you read, if you read 
judges, you would not say, man, Israel is so faithful and God is just, he's a jerk. He's a big, bad meanie. He's just, he's just, he's sticking it to him. No, that's not what's going on here. What's happening here is Israel has been faithless. They, they're, they're, they're a bunch of, of, of wicked people. And, and so then Ruth starts out in this context. But what's so amazing is that God is so merciful in spite of all this sin. Okay, is everyone tracking with me how you're going to do this? Is everyone feeling good about this? You feel good? 